In this video, I'd like to look at why opposition to slavery was unsuccessful. Now, as a quick recap from the last video, you will remember hearing that slavery grew massively in the Deep South. And it grew massively really for four reasons. The enforced movement of the enslaved, the cotton gin, the pushing system, and the Louisiana Purchase. And for all those reasons, slavery boomed in the Deep South in this period. Now, what I do not want you to think is that everybody agreed with it because they didn't and there was opposition to slavery in this period and there was definite opposition to this to slavery in this early period of the United States history but that opposition obviously didn't work and it didn't work because slavery grew at this rapid rate so in this video I'd really like to look at some reasons why opposition failed and why they weren't able to kind of slow the spread of slavery in the deep south. Right, let's look at the first reason. And the first reason of why opposition didn't work is that slave rebellions split opinion. So the enslaved on the plantations did not tolerate their horrific conditions lying down. In fact, many of them revolted and led rebellions against the white plantation owners. The most famous example of that is in 1811. And in 1811, a really serious rebellion broke out in the Deep South in Louisiana, led by a man called Charles des Londes, of which this painting is a portrait of. And the, rebe the rebels themselves killed many, many white people in that rebellion. Local forces ended the revolt two days later and Charles himself was really brutally killed along with 25 other rebel leaders and their heads were put on spikes along the river where the rebellion took place. Now, those rebellions caused fear throughout the United States and in particular in the South and in the North. And in the South, they obviously feared these rebellions because their economy was so driven by the slave plantations, but also in the North. And the reaction in the North is really interesting because in the North, many people said that it proved slavery didn't work because if the enslaved people were treated better, they wouldn't have rebelled. But even in the North, there was that racism that we talked about in previous videos. And even in the North, they feared what might happen if the US just immediately freed two million slaves. So slave rebellions, despite the fact that in some places they were encouraged and in some places people applauded them, they didn't completely win people over. Now, the second reason why opposition in this period doesn't work and doesn't succeed is that abolitionists were not united. So abolitionists are people that want to abolish and get rid of the slave trade. And they really weren't united in this period. And their number is growing, but they weren't a unified group and they held lots of different views. Some abolitionists just didn't like the power that slavery gave the South. The South tried to tell the North what to do with legal cases of enslaved people that ran away. And many abolitionists just didn't like that power that the South had over the North. Some abolitionists, like Lloyd Garrison, who's here, called for the slaves' immediate emancipation. Others thought that emancipation, the freeing of the slaves, should be gradual. Some wanted to remove the slaves and send them to Africa despite the fact that most of the slaves had not ever set foot in Africa in their lives. Now today we would told, call this view extremely racist, and it is. But at the time it shows that the differing views the abolitionists had. Some abolitionists encouraged the revolts that we saw about on the last slide against plantation owners, but some didn't agree with violence at all. And this disunity between the abolitionists means that they weren't a united force calling for the end of slavery. And as a result, they don't succeed. But the third biggest reason why opposition fails in this period is that the US was completely reliant on slavery for its wealth. Its economy was reliant upon slavery. It needed slavery in order to work. 
In the south, slave owners, who made up 25% of the population, were completely reliant on enslaved people to make their plantations work. But even other people in the south, other non-slave owning people, the 75% of the rest of the population, they were also reliant on this business. So for example, everybody who worked on the boats that transported the cotton up and down rivers like the Mississippi, people who ran the auction houses that you can see in this picture here, people were reliant on slavery in order for their livelihood and their own wealth. And it wasn't even in the south, it was also in the north. And even in the north, where these were free states, where there wasn't really any slavery at all, even in the north, people were reliant on slavery in order to exist. Because northern factories made fabric from the cotton that was produced by the enslaved people of the south. And the factory owners and workers needed the raw product that was made by enslaved people in order to make their own livelihoods. And rich northerners and banks bought land in the south and they sold it making more money. So really a huge amount of the economy of the United States at this period is driven by and reliant upon slavery. So opposition to slavery was never going to work when the entire economic system was driven by it. Opposition also didn't work because they actually reached a compromise between the North, who were the free states, and the slave-owning South states. So in 1818, there were 11 slave states in the South, and there were 11 free states where they didn't have slavery in the North. Now, there was nearly a very, very strong uh, argument in 1818, because Missouri, which you can see located on this map here, applied to become a state and it wanted to allow slavery. Now, if Missouri had joined in, there would have been 12, 11, sorry, 12 slave states and 11 free states, and it would have completely upset the balance. And there was a massive debate about whether they should let Missouri become a state or not, and they didn't at this point. But in 19, 1819, Maine also applied to become a state, but applies to become a free state. And this allows a chance for a compromise to be made. So the Missouri Compromise is signed in 1820 and the Missouri Compromise allows Missouri to become a slave state and it allows Maine to become a free state, thus keeping the balance. So now you've got 12 slave states, 12 free states. So you can't have any one of them trying to enforce their power in Congress and really try and make laws that are favorable to one or the other. And this idea of the Missouri Compromise is really kept for the next 30 years, where they agree that for every slave state that gets added, you have to also add a free state and you have to keep that balance. And they also agree that any that slavery would never spread north of the dotted line that you can see here on this map. And this is known as the Missouri Compromise line. So slavery is kept in the south and the people of the north are kept free. This means that opposition doesn't grow because they've actually agreed something and they've agreed a compromise that means that stops their anger and what's potentially going to be causing conflict. And the last reason why opposition doesn't succeed in this period is because of this man here. And this man here is President Andrew Jackson. Now Jackson's going to come back into our story in the next video when we look at what happens to the Native Americans in this period. And Jackson is, is not a hugely pleasant man. He's president of the US from 1829 to 1837. He's a southerner and he openly supports slavery. And because he's openly supporting slavery, he allows banks to lend larger sums to people who want to invest in any business connected with cotton. And it's funnily enough, if you get the president of a country supporting something, if you're trying to oppose it, that's not going to work. So if we're looking at the big question here of why was opposition to slavery unsuccessful, we've got five reasons. The slave rebellion split opinion and caused fear. Abolitionists weren't united. The United States economy was completely reliant on slavery. The Missouri Compromise stopped potential conflict and anger. And Andrew Jackson supporting slavery in this way meant that opposition, despite the fact it is growing, was never going to stop the growth of slavery 
that really is like a juggernaut during this period, getting bigger and bigger and bigger.